Well, welcome once again. This is the Doctor of Digital and the Doctor of Digital Podcast. Purpose of the show is to transform your business and life with education and inspiration. I introduce busy business leaders to trends in business, technology, and marketing to highlight people you should know. Do you know what it takes to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, navigate a nuclear submarine for months on end, and run a multi-million dollar business? My guest isn't just an accomplished executive life coach. He's a seasoned adventurer and problem solver with a truly remarkable background. Tune in as we delve into his fascinating story, exploring how he leverages his unique experiences to empower others to overcome obstacles, build stronger relationships, and achieve success, both personally and professionally. My guest is a force to be reckoned with a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University and former nuclear submarine officer. He brings a unique blend of technical expertise and leadership skills to the table. He's not just about theory. He's climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, canoed from Pittsburgh to New Orleans, and successfully managed a $100 million manufacturing business. Now, as an executive life coach, he helps individuals and businesses navigate challenges with a powerful approach built on clear communication, healthy boundaries, and a deep understanding of human behavior. During this episode, we'll do a deep dive into the changes and hot topics of running a $100 million manufacturing company. We will leverage the expertise of my guests and how to navigate the unique dynamics of the field. By the end of this episode, you'll be better equipped to know what to do, and I encourage you to contact my guest, Mike Starr, Executive Coaching Services. With that, welcome to the program, Michael. How are you today? Doing great. Thanks. It's an honor to be here, Mick. Well, likewise, I'm honored to have you here. And here's the interesting thing. I always ask a guest something about their background. But with you, I have no idea where to start because you've done so many remarkable things. So tell us about your background and how you got into your field. Well, I... uh... I'm particularly focused at this stage in my life on um, helping people reduce suffering and conflict, uh, having more hope and coming up with sustainable uh, and meaningful results and outcomes. And my uh, my journey, which ended up leading to the writing of my book, Journey into Peace, began about 25 years ago um, in the midst of some very severe family crises and uh, work and professional, uh, I guess, challenges. And through all that time, I I began a quest. I began to seek the answer to the following question. What can I do to help others reduce suffering, reduce their, I guess, despondency or hopelessness, and and really get some meaningful results and improve their peace with themselves and the people around them? And um, along the way, I've learned through my uh, hitchhiking around the, the country for five months into uh, Mexico and Guatemala and the United States and flying into um, Tikal and eventually experiences on a nuclear submarine, climbing Kilimanjaro, canoeing from Pittsburgh to New Orleans. And I, I, I developed a whole, I guess, set of convictions about what's right and what's wrong, what works and what doesn't work. Um, though I took a lot of classes in statistics and probability, I have a life experience in my laboratory life of what is likely to occur between cause and effect. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between symptoms and and root causes? And so in a nutshell, that's a little bit about my background and why I have decided to focus in on helping others to uh, to get along better with themselves and suffer less. You know, it's a really interesting thing to be focused on, especially in mentioning your book, because if I can't think of anything that's more pressing issue in the world today than peace. I mean, it's something that we all seek and desire and want, but have a frustrating inability to accomplishment. I'm wondering now that since you've had so many experiences and now some time has gone by, what would you say are some of the biggest changes that you've experienced and seen? I think on a personal level, what I see is that there is a 
tendency to develop what I call contra identities. It's part of my language for peace, progress, and healing. And a contra identity is an identity where I see myself in contrast to someone else. I'm better because you're worse. I'm smart because you're stupid. I'm valuable because you're invaluable. I'm superior because you I've seen that contra identity grow quite a bit. I've seen victimhood really take off in the last 15 years. I've seen a desire to be, I guess, um, enabled to, uh, I guess, feel like someone owes you something. I grew up in an era where if it's to be, it's up to me. And and I believe in self-reliance. And I think the movement away from self-reliance towards dependence has been pretty, pretty extreme. And the worst thing that I've seen the most I guess the most disappointing thing is the divisiveness, how quickly people grow to be angry, uh, uh, to so the social, what I call lynch mobs, descend on people who have contrary views. Uh, this uh, divisiveness and anger and intolerance. In my book, I talk about common ground has become most uncommon. The willingness mm-hmm. to agree to disagree is a, is a rare commodity. So this whole movement into a sort of a dark area uh, is is alarming and and i'm hoping that my book will be the beginning of a narrative that moves us away towards an area where we find common ground because as human beings in our humanity we have so much in common yeah we have more in common than we have not in common but i absolutely agree with you it's it's a lack of peace in the world, but it's a lack of peace in human relationships too, which is really key and very insightful in terms of your book and your expressions. And do you think just along these lines that there has been an impact of COVID and things like that? Because a lot of people identify even that has accelerated some of these things that have happened. Yes, I agree. I think the, the, although it was, certainly deeply entrenched at that point in time. Uh, I think COVID just accelerated it. You know, you had the whole craziness associated with, um, uh, you know, the burning of cities and towns in in the midst of COVID over the, you know, untragic um, experience that happened to one individual. But yeah, it it isolated people more. I think it made people more, prone to dehumanize one another. You know, when you're working with dozens and hundreds of people every day, you you have empathy and you have appreciation for people. Uh, and But when you're isolated and you're behind your computer, it's easy to, uh, I guess, demonize and, and, and lose that humanity and caring about the individual. So I think it has, as you said, accelerated it and, and moved us further down into a a dark area. Are there some things that you would identify as like hot topics and in a good sense? I mean, are there some elements that you would say that make you more hopeful and things that you say are positive directions that we're going in? I do. I, I particularly in the last year, and maybe that's a bit of the post COVID and returning to normalcy, you know, you know, Restricting young children from going to school, that was a you know, problematic and, and in retrospect, probably a, a big mistake. And so I think that return to normalcy is, uh, is allowing more people to, uh, to question, even though there is sort of a, I call it almost a diabolical uh, kind of initiative that when someone's disagreeing with a public narrative, the PC narrative, will they'll descend on them. But there's more and more people who are courageous and willing to say, well, wait a minute, you know, did it really make sense that we had young kids kept out of school during that period mm-hmm. of time? And there's people uh, like, uh, he may be controversial, but he's one of my heroes is uh, Jordan Peterson, who is really mm-hmm. a bastion for uh, I think clarity and logic. He's not sure. particularly politically aligned, but he's very much aligned of, you know, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And to somewhat a degree, even uh, as controversial as he is, Elon Musk has been, uh, in some ways, uh, 
someone willing to stand up for for something that's a little bit more truthful and logical, whether it's uh, you know the Sacramento Bee with their humor, et cetera. So I, I think there's people willing to stand up, even mm. in the minority communities. I see more and more. Wait a minute, we don't need to buy into this binary uh, kind of narrative. There, there's a gray area. Let's 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 think about this, and and instead of saying pursue the science, maybe we should ask our question what science really is, which is about questioning and and uh, and wanting to understand why the alternative is not true or is true. Yeah, there, there is even something about the science because as a historian, I always say, well, people look at the medieval period and they say, well, I've accepted things on faith, but a lot of the things that we've seen post-COVID and during COVID, well, it was based on something which was irrational. So it's not just the past, but I mean, even we have become victims to the things of calling it science when it's not really science and we didn't have a lot of information initially. Can you apply some of these ideas <clears throat> excuse me, to businesses? And what would you recommend businesses, given the site and the problems of human nature, how does this apply to the business world? Well, I think it's challenging. Uh, you know, I've been retired from from corporate business for for quite a while, uh, going on seven or eight years, and and so there is a sort of an, an unavoidable need to kind of tread the the line on a certain PC things. But I I would say is um, try to stay close to reality, <laughs> try to stay close to what's true, try to stay close to probabilities and statistics and the willingness to say, wait a minute, maybe there is another alternative and, and be open-minded about to promote open-mindedness and not mm. to be, um, you know, Elon Musk, I realize he's controversial, but he says, you know, you're not going to blackmail me to say what you want me to say. I'd rather lose, you know, some some uh, financial gain because I'm going to stand up for what I believe to be true. So I think it's the ethics of business of not, I guess, bowing to the, the PC culture and, and, and enjoining some things that are actually contributing to the confusion of people, especially young people who are in a really difficult situation trying to figure out what's right and wrong. And, and go back to the basics of empowering your workers. Uh, I have a, a, a very simple question that I used when we ran our improvement teams, and, and mm -hmm. it was a simple question. We just met with the representative groups in all the work areas, and they had 150 people um, in these work areas working three shifts. And the question was this, how can we make your job easier? and focus on that and and what are the obstacles to your job being easier and what that led to was safer uh, environment because it was a, an industrial environment it led to higher yeah. productivity greater quality and better empowerment in the employees and to ask questions about how we can make your job easier but be be willing to say i'm not here to avoid you being offended i think that's that's where my bs alarm goes off I'm here to keep you from getting hurt. I'm here for to listen to you and show that you have value. I'm here to help us please the customer and do what's safe for the society and community around here. But mm. as far as you being offended, that's your personal, you know, kind of choice, you know. And I, I found in the corporate world when it came to uh, equal opportunity, when it came to uh, treating people fairly, over the 40 years that I lived, the progress we made and continue to make was remarkable. Now, some of this, of course, I'm sure you understand, goes against the grain and goes against <laughs> some things in PC business culture. So how do you address those questions when it comes to businesses? Because there are businesses who are now conceding to the PC culture or even what people call it the cancel culture. You know, I, I think you'd have to almost have uh, the courage of a Elon Musk uh, at various levels. And I think it starts at the highest level uh, with the CEO and moves down to say, hey, look, we get it that you're offended. We get it that you're sensitive to these issues. But, you know, just because you're offended doesn't mean it's a fact. And, uh, you know, as Jordan Peterson would say, part of 
healthy discourse, healthy dialogue is for people to naturally become offended. It's part of uh, I agree and you disagree. So I think you've got to have courage from the top and say, you know, we're willing to take some financial hits because what's at stake is the heart of our, our, our country. What's at stake is the yeah. sanity of our country. What's at stake is the sanity of our children. I really fear that our young people are on a disastrous course towards severe mental illness in the decades ahead. I'm very active in the NAMI community, National Alliance right. for Mental Illness. I'm very active yes. in the Al-Anon community, which is support for alcoholic families. I think I have some understanding about, you know, psychology and, and how we can help people. Uh, the, the degree of depression, of suicide, drug addiction, confusion, anger is, um, it, it's, it's almost at a critical mass. And we've got to say, look, this this we need to turn the tide here and we need to stand up for you know what's sane and right uh for the good of not only the entire nation but for these young people who are really they uh, they're very malleable and you know you, you could take somebody like hitler and see what he did to the youth of his country yeah. or yeah. even someone like stalin and see what he did to the youth of their country you know you repeat a lie long enough and i think Goebbels said that if you repeat a lie long enough it becomes the truth and there's got, there's got to be people stand up and say, this is BS. My BS alarm is going off and I don't care. It's going to hurt some of our profits. But we realize that not only do we have profits at stake here, but we have the, the heart of a very, I think, something I'm very proud of, very strong entrepreneurial and capitalistic society that has produced more good than it has harm. Yeah, absolutely. And the idea of extending the lie was it's the so-called big lie. So the bigger the lie, the easier it is to foist it upon the people. And that's unfortunate. And we've got a lot of big lies out there. I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about your expertise in terms of process and in terms of somebody working with you? Like, what do you do and what is that process like? So what could businesses benefit from your background, your expertise? Well, I think we all agree uh, from a common ground uh, in in business is that we would very few people would disagree that we want to reduce waste, which is part of the lean process and, you know, the continuous improvement in quality circles. So let's all agree that we don't want to have waste. We don't want to waste time. We don't want to waste money. We don't want to waste energy. And mm -hmm. we certainly don't want to waste human resources and human talent. So let's begin with that. And then I think we need to move on to just um, including our employees in the overall solving of problems, whether it be on the production line or in the service area, and, and realize that who's important? Our customers are important. The community is important. Mm -hmm. um, and the employees are important, as well as the stockholders. So there's a lot we could do. I, I had these improvement team meetings with, at one time, I was running like, 11 meetings a week with all three shifts. And I'd say, hey, how can we um, make your job easier? We'd write down their items that were legitimate on something I called the obstacle log. We posted in the work area and we updated it once a week. In one area, our major production line, we, we actually eliminated almost 300 obstacles in two years. Uh, out of about 330, so a very high percentage rate of obstacles we could eliminate. And we stopped focusing on individuals. We stopped focusing on outcome. We focused on process. What can we do in the process of changing information from shift to shift or in the process of even gathering tools or knowing we had visual management where I could look out in the shop and say, hey, there's all the major parts for tomorrow's production line. So focus on process uh, and these obstacles we made in two years, Mick, uh, which for those of you who are familiar with the production area, which I'm sure there's quite a few, uh, we made a 60% improvement in two years on our production line, which was phenomenal by reducing waste, by improving the handoffs through visual management, but most of all through improving including the employees' ideas. They felt really empowered, engaged, and we improved their personal safety. We reduced injuries. And you know, and you hate to see someone break a leg or have a bad laceration or lose an eye. And so injuries went down, productivity went up, quality went up, rework went down, 
um, by incorporating ideas for employees in a process, focused on process, and, and to get away from, well, Joe on second shift or the supervisor or management mm -hmm. says, no, no, no. How can we improve our standards, improve our process, and, and make it routine about what we do every day so there's not, not a lot of decisions that need to be made about what do we do next? And oddly enough, you know, you didn't say one word about profit but what happens? Profit goes up, right? You've <laughs> improved everything. Absolutely. It's sort of like, uh, it's like if you improve your prep, you know, as an old saying, success is preparation meeting opportunity. If you prepare well, success is likely. When I landed in Kilimanjaro Airport uh, around midnight in the, in the dark, after a year of preparation, getting ready to go on safari for a number of days and then later on to climb Kilimanjaro, I said this to myself when I was standing waiting for my driver to take me to the to the hotel where we would uh, begin the, uh, the process of hiking. I says, you're done. <laughs> You've, you're done. You've made the preparations. Let the game begin. There's nothing mm -hmm. left to do. And that's the case. You focus on the preparations and not the outcome. And it's like, you know, even in sports, like a <clears throat> football team, if you've done all your preparation, all your practice, your weightlifting, I've st studied your playbook. When you're on the field, pretty much you've done what needs to be done. Now you just play the game. And so um, focus on the process, focus on the preparation. Uh, the outcome will be as it will be. One of the terms in my book, I call the natural order things. Well, things will become as they are meant to become. So what you can impact is your preparations to let mm -hmm. an outcome that's more likely to occur, not guaranteed to occur. And that includes profitability, which comes from not doing as much rework, better quality, improving your reputation, employee engagement, innovativeness, all those things when you have that kind of a circle of, hey, how can I make your job? Simple question, how can I make your job easier? And who doesn't want to hear their boss come up and say to them, hey, Joe, Mary, how can I make your job easier? I mean, they'll be like, hey, sit down. You got an hour? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like execute. It reminds me of high school. We worked really hard on the basketball team and our coach would say game day is fun. And it was, he was exactly right. We trained exactly. so hard. We were ready. You just get out there and you execute. And the game was yeah, fun. Exactly. Yes. We were ready. You know, you've yeah. mentioned a couple of times your book and their background, which is pretty fascinating. I'm wondering, could you tell us how to get a hold of your book and how would somebody reach out to you? How do they get a hold of you? What would you recommend? Yeah, the uh, the book is called uh, Journey into Peace by Michael M. Starr. Uh, actually, the full title is Journey into Peace, a Language for Peace, Progress, and Healing. And you can get it on Amazon, either through uh, uh, Kindle or as a paperback. Uh, also, uh, you can uh, get a hold of me through executivecoachingservices.net, executivecoachingservices.net. And I have various coaching programs there, uh, and I'd be happy to mentor or work with anybody who would be interested in uh, helping them facilitate their journey into peace to achieve more progress and more peace and more healing in their life. Sounds fantastic. And what a great background and great ideas that you have expressed. So Michael, thanks for taking out some time. I appreciate your time and I appreciate you taking out some time for your busy schedule for all those next adventures that you're going to go on. Thanks, Mick. Appreciate this opportunity. You bet. Thanks again. So we'll see you next time. But you know, if you like something like Mike has presented here today, I mean, come on, what a fantastic guest and all these great ideas he has. And I hope you pick up a copy of his book because it's awesome. You know, if you want episodes like this, make sure that you are liking, subscribing, positively reviewing and sharing the Dr. Digital podcast. And of course, I do want to thank the publishers of both Burning America and On Track Ian Hunter for their support on all things that they've done for me and the program. Until next time, this is the Dr. Digital signing off. Deus Volt.